My name's Susan Marks. I'm from the Law Department here at LSE, and I'd like to wish you all a very warm welcome uh, to this evening public lecture. Almost 20 years ago, the Nigerian human rights lawyer and advocate, Chidi Anselm Odin Kalu, wrote of the predicament of human rights in Africa. Human rights were in crisis in the region, he wrote, and that was at once a crisis of human rights and a crisis for human rights. The crisis of human rights was, of course, the massive gap between the standards enunciated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the realities of life for many, indeed most people, in the region. The crisis for human rights was the seeming disconnect between that situation and the discourse and modalities of popular struggle. In his words, the, it was the fact that while Africa's human rights problems are immense, even ubiquitous, most of our people do not describe their problems in human rights terms. Odin Kalu pointed to various reasons that might account for this, reasons which incidentally were in no way exhausted by a simple lack of education. And he then concluded by suggesting that people would continue to struggle for their rights whether or not the language of human rights was available to them, but to quote again his words, they will not build their struggle around the notion of human rights unless that language and those who wish to popularize it speak directly to their aspirations and survival. What then of today? And now we might widen the compass to take in not only Africa, but the world as a whole. The crisis of human rights remains all too evident and in some ways it's plainly very much worse than was the case two decades ago. But what of the crisis for human rights? Has that also persisted or even deepened? And if it has, what are the conditions in which that has happened? How are we to understand the alienation uh, to which Odin Kalu has directed our attention? And what are we or should we be doing about that? To help us think through these and related questions, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce this evening's speaker, Salil Shetty. As you all know, Salil is the Secretary General of Amnesty International. He's the organization's eighth Secretary General, having assumed office in 2010 and serving, uh, as I've just learned, two terms um, in that capacity. Prior to joining Amnesty, Salil was director of the UN Millennium Campaign uh, from uh, 2003 to 2010. He was responsible there for building support for and developing initiatives to realize the Millennium Development Goals. Before that, he had an important tenure as chief executive of the international development NGO ActionAid from 1999 to 2003. Salil is a graduate of the Indian Institute of Management and I'm proud to say also of this school where he took our MSc in Social Policy and Planning. It's difficult to think of anyone with their finger closer to the pulse of human rights than Salil Shetty and it's an immense pleasure and privilege to invite him now to speak. His title is Decolonizing Human Rights. The reason I wanted to show you this at the outset was because I have a very long speech. And uh, I, I must say, Susan, this is the longest speech I've ever given in my life, so please get ready for this. Uh, I was told that LSE academic audiences have high tolerance for long durations of long speeches. Um, but it's, it's great to be back at the LSE. Um, it's a long time since I was a grad student here, actually a very long time. Um, and it's also several years since I spoke at the LSE. My time at the LSE, uh, my sort of abiding memory of my time at LSE was listening to uh, Nicholas Stern, my economics, my growth theory professor of economics, uh, 
for months, and I, I must say that I didn't understand almost any word of what he said. I'm sure that that's very different from the law school now, and Susan's doing, I mean, it's really, it, it, I didn't understand much of it when I was here, but um, then Nick Stern became the chief economist of the World Bank, and, and our paths crossed many times since he was also heading uh, Diffid's economics team, so it started making sense very slowly. So it's, it's great to have the opportunity to be back at LSE and talk about the human rights struggles in these very complicated times. And I, I speak very much as a practitioner. Um, I know that there are many people in this room who have much stronger academic and scholarly credentials than I have, so apologies in advance for any imperfections. As you know, this is a big year for human rights. In December, we will mark the 70 years since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted. That was a landmark moment in human history, and the anniversary this year should be something we should all be celebrating. Now, over the seven, uh, sorry, of course, there have been huge gains during these seven decades, too many to list. If I had been alive at that moment on the eve of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, shaken by the horrors and inhumanity of the Second World War, and I had been able to see seven decades ahead, I may be pleasantly surprised to see an elaborate international normative system that includes protection of refugees, respect for the rights of indigenous peoples, protection of the rights of people with disabilities, fighting the scourge of torture, and fulfillment of such rights to dignity as the human right to water and sanitation. With the controversial precedent of the Nuremberg and Tokyo war crimes tribunals then, who among us in 1948 would have taken it for granted that the next 70 years would see the forces for justice of an international criminal court? I should remember to move these slides. I spoke at SOAS last week and forgot to do that completely. So over the, over this period, as I said, um, and this, this is the picture of the International Criminal Court. Now, the ICC that seeks accountability for atrocities, and then the international tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda, and of the range of hybrid courts from the Special Court for Sierra Leone, through the special panels for serious crimes in East Timor, to the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. Who could have predicted this? So over the seven decades in the life of the modern, formal, international human rights system, there have been major steps forward for women's rights, LGBTI rights, the global fight against the death penalty is being won, slowly but surely. Frameworks and mechanisms have been put in place to protect civilians in conflict, children in war zones, and in peacetime and migrants and their families, just to name a few. Yet, it looks and feels to many of us that believe in human rights that this is not a time for celebration. Rather, we look with serious concern on the future of human rights. Now, why do I think this is an anxious moment? The international human rights system is deadlocked, unable to respond effectively to crisis, whether Myanmar, <coughs> or Syria, or Gaza, from which this picture has been taken last week alone. Very few leaders stand ready to champion human rights and provide ethical leadership in the world. And in so many individual countries, the picture is very bleak. <clears throat> in Turkey, where one third of all the world's imprisoned journalists languish in jail, in Venezuela, where 120 people were killed last year in protests against the government. In South Sudan, in Philippines, with President Duterte's abusive so-called war on drugs, which we call the war on poor. In Hungary, where the government has launched an all-out assault on organizations speaking out for refugees. The list is long, 
So reaching the 70th anniversary, it's a good moment for us to take stock and ask the fundamental question, why do we need human rights and what are they really for? But in order to address this question, we have to get some clarity, I think, at the outset on what we mean by human rights. Now, this might be a blasphemous statement to make in the hallowed portals of the LSE Law School. But the fact is that human rights often mean different things to different people. And they don't mean anything at all for a good number of people in the developing world. But putting a positive spin on it, local interpretation and definition could be a strength for human rights. But it can also be a slippery slope, as we all know. And in practice, <coughs> varied understandings mean that we can easily be speaking at cross purposes. And forgive me for personalizing this a little bit. Growing up in India in the 70s, at a time when Prime Minister Indira Gandhi declared a national emergency, suspending pretty much all civil and political rights, with both my parents being active in the Dalit and women's rights struggles, I became president of my college students' union, but I never classified myself as a human rights activist. And maybe that's because the language and discourse of human rights in the way we talk about it in London, Geneva, and New York was little known to most Indians at the time. Now that I know this discourse, I certainly feel in retrospect that I would qualify as a human rights defender. But I don't think that this lack of awareness has changed much in the body politic for India. And this is despite being in India being home to some of the greatest revolutionaries and reformers from Buddha to Mahatma Phule to Narayana Guru to Guru Gobind Singh um, and of course Ambedkar who wrote pretty much the progressive and impressive constitution of India. Interestingly, I think those who even know Ambedkar's constitution um, and in fact know constitutional rights and these are very educated people in India. The same person might speak very uh, vocally in favor of the Constitution of India and at the same time against human rights in the same breath. So I think it's really important for, for me to clarify what human rights mean to me as a working definition for this talk. And I see human rights very simply as the struggles of ordinary people to hold those in power to account particularly power that is abused by those in government or corporations. Of course, these days we've become more conscious of the abuse of power by non-state actors as well. Now, it does not matter whether we are talking about this at the level of a violent husband or an abusive landlord or a government criminalizing people because of who they are or states playing games with people's lives at the UN Security Council. All of these are about the abuse of power against the powerless. And this is why we need some rules of the game. This is why we need human rights. Now, let us, with this understanding, get to the topic of today's discussion about decolonizing human rights. Now, do human rights need decolonizing? Is that the right approach to this question? What do we mean by colonization of human rights? Now, this talk is not about the history of human rights, but I want to talk about how we as people who believe in human rights can set ourselves up for success in the face of challenges which are probably more intensive today than at any moment in the history of human rights. And I'm using the lens of decolonization to say three things about the history, the present, and the future of human rights. Firstly, the essence of human rights and decolonization are basically the same thing. The struggle for freedom against the abuse of power. That's what's common. The modern human rights framework, as we know it, was born in the crucible of decolonization. It is a historical context we would do well to remember. Secondly, human rights themselves have always been subject to efforts at colonization, misappropriation, and being manipulated for political ends. We need to recognize this for what it is, and in this sense, the fight to decolonize human rights is a permanent one. And thirdly, to be true to the character of human rights, we need to reconnect again with the struggles of ordinary people against abuse of power. So to the first point, relating the history of human rights, I want to be clear about my historical lens when I'm talking about 
the human rights system and its origins. I'll start with the backdrop. Human rights in the last one and a half centuries were in an odd and artificial way linked to the project of colonization itself before they more genuinely became a part of the reverse effect of resistance against colonization. So let me quote a couple of people in this context. Here's Joseph Conrad writing at the end of the 19th century. And he says the conquest of the earth, which mostly means the taking it away from those who have a different complexion or slightly flatter noses than ourselves is not a pretty thing when you look at it too much. What redeems it is the idea only, an idea at the back of it. Now the idea at the back of it, or rather the ideas at the back of colonialism are of course notorious, but perhaps none bring out the close relationship between colonialism and human rights as the pretensions of the Berlin Conference to link the pursuit of commerce by colonial powers with the supposed benefits of such commerce to the well-being of colonized peoples. As Anthony Angi summarizes a point in his provocative study of 13 years ago, in his opening speech at the conference says <coughs> Anthony Angi, Prince Bismarck noted that all the governments invited share the wish to bring the natives of Africa within the pale of civilization by opening up the interior of the continent commerce. Trade was not what it has been earlier, a means of simply maximizing profit and increasing national power. Rather, trade was an indispensable part of the civilizing mission itself. The expansion of commerce was the means by which the backward natives could be civilized. So against this backdrop, colonialism and early modern day human rights, in my view, fed upon each other. Indeed, the development and flourishing of the institution of international law itself, with its definition and consolidation of the notions of sovereignty, statehood, trusteeship, and protection, became inextricably linked to the colonial project. No wonder then that in Africa, Macau Mutua could express his horror at the way modern human rights struggles seem to echo rather too loudly the annoying portrait of savages, victims, and saviors. In Asia, Nicholas Dirks could demonstrate how British domination did not invent caste, but shaped it in enduring ways. In Latin America, Ricardo Salvatore, in his discussions of coloniality, reminds us that while we must challenge the homogenizing narrative of a supposedly singular, long-term colonial heritage across the region, colonialism itself interacted closely with notions such as barbarism and salvation from barbarism. So let's fast forward to this current moment in history. It's clear that the early symbiotic relationship that I have sketched out between colonialism and human rights still casts a long shadow over current understandings of human rights. And that's clear when we hear governing elites resisting international justice because they say it's a neo-colonial project. When we see the doctrine of responsibility to protect being dismissed by some as nothing but disguised imperial intervention. And when we touch the unclothed skin of malnourished children to find that the medicine, food, and clothes that they should have received has been diverted into private coffers by states, the same states which then prevent effective scrutiny and review by human rights treaty bodies at the United Nations behind the facade of sovereignty. So that's the backdrop, and that's the current legacy of colonialism and coloniality on human rights. Yet, I would argue that this is a limited and misleading narrative. I believe that understanding the colonial aspect of the institution of human rights does offer some insights, but it is no way nearly the most important part of the story. Ultimately, as I said earlier, human rights are about the ongoing struggle of marginalized and oppressed peoples and individuals against abuse, distortion, and excess of power. It has been long fashionable, or it's long been fashionable to look at human rights in terms of North versus South or East versus West, emphasizing the Northern or Southern philosophical underpinnings, or focusing on the Cold War dynamic between the US and the USSR. But what these analyses tend to miss is the historical connection between the human rights system and 
element of people's struggle against oppression. The whole purpose of human rights demands that our vantage point is not top down, but bottom up. And historically, many of those struggles were, of course, decolonization struggles. But then, in many cases, they evolved into the struggles of ordinary people whose European colonizers were replaced by domestic leaders cut from very similar cloth. And here it's important to mention the role of Latin American states in framing the human rights system, drawing from the history of colonialism and domination by European states. This was the arena in which many of the basic concepts of an international system to protect human rights were being drawn up before World War II, something which Catherine Sickink expounds in detail in her latest book, Evidence for Hope. In pushing this agenda, these states had to struggle against resistance from dominant powers, especially the United States and UK. And ultimately, countries from the South prevailed on a number of issues. Chief, uh, chief among them were women's rights. Some of you may not be aware that at the 1945 <coughs> San Francisco Conference, convened to set up new post-war international organization, the US and UK delegates were actively opposed to the women's rights agenda being pushed by champions <coughs> such as Bertha Lutz from Brazil and Hansa Mehta from India. We have Mehta to thank for the fact that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights does not extol the freedom and equality of all men, but all human beings. Or in other words, that it is universal. There are plenty of other examples immersed of people and of countries and peoples immersed in or emerging from decolonization struggles, bringing that experience to the process of international norm setting. In a speech earlier this year, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, Zaid Al Hussein, rightly highlighted the important role of the Philippines in pushing for very strong language on torture and countries such as Costa Rica, Ghana, Jamaica, Lebanon, and Liberia on the dignity of the human person. And to that list, we could add more. Today, a pioneering, pioneering region in the abolition of death penalty is Africa, where in 1981, only one country, Capo Verde, had abolished it for all crimes. Yet, at the end of 2017, the number had risen to 20. A key motivation for nationalist governments that abolished the death penalty in Africa was their memory of how this cruel punishment had been used against their comrades in their struggles against colonialism. The South African and Indian courts have pioneered creative and robust jurisprudence on economic, social, and cultural rights. You only need to read the reasoning of the judges in path-breaking cases such as Francis Corali Mullen to be left in no doubt that a concept of human dignity that challenges colonial ideas of humanity is at play here. And in this context, we remember too the struggles which long predated the international human rights system, like that against the transatlantic slave trade, the struggles within struggles in the context of decolonization as disempowered groups, such as the untouchables in India, fought for a voice. And later, of course, the civil rights movement in the United States, whose legacy and influence remains crucial even today. And the popular struggles for civic freedoms in the Soviet Union, which are an important part of the background of the Helsinki Accords. Fundamentally then, human rights arise from the experience of people's struggles against injustice, against oppression, and against the abusive use of power. It is in this context that we can locate human rights not as the accoutrements of the commerce of Bismarck and other colonial plunderers, and not as Cold War football between the East and the West, but as ongoing markers of struggle and solidarity. Now to my second major point. Just as a modern human rights system was born from a particular political context, it has been misappropriated and instrumentalized in many different ways since 1948. Or put in another way, <clears throat> there have always been multiple levels of colonization in the story of human rights. Partly this is down to the fact that human rights, which are fundamentally a set of tools for struggle, are conceived as a set of state obligations, consensual and binding, but without sufficiently effective means for enforcement. 
So they're structurally prone to capture instrumentalization and distortion. And I want to mention different ways in which this kind of recolonization has happened and continues to happen. So to start with, we have long since seen the domination of the human rights infrastructure by the elite. And that goes right back to its earliest days. Just because the human rights system was forced in the furnace of decolonization, at least in part, does not mean that it automatically served the cause of the have-nots. It is clear that this was a project of the elites. In fact, Bertha Luz in this picture, while a feminist of great standing, enjoyed the patronage of the Brazilian dictator, Getulio Vargas, who cracked down on political organizing by the non-elites in the country. <coughs> Mohandas Gandhi, from my country, exposed <coughs> lofty ideals on untouchability, while, while essentially supporting a caste system that kept tens of millions in servile conditions in India. So decolonization may have liberated millions from oppressive imperial rule, but for many of those whom Franz <coughs> Fanon classified as the wretched of the earth, one colonial colonialism was replaced by another. The nationalist leaders enthralled to form former colonial powers who set the economic rules. For human rights to work, another decolonization was needed to put these tools in the hands of people to stand up against oppressive power with genuine agency. Yet, the emphasis on human rights as law and armchair debates about East versus West have done little to place human rights tools into the hands of those who need them the most. Equally is the way in which the appropriation and domination of human rights by Western powers, often for neo-colonial projects, has been seen again and again. We are all too familiar with this story. The idea gained currency that Northern or Western powers were the guardians and guarantors of human rights in the world. Human rights were somehow an accessory of the Pax Americana. And human rights, or to be specific civil and political rights, became associated with the dominant political and economic models promoted by powerful Western countries, a blend of electoral democracy and the market economy. But the Western hypocrisy around rights found its absurd apotheosis in Guantanamo Bay, a human rights vacuum created explicitly in the service of a so-called war on terror, being fought in the name of freedom and the values of underpinning human rights. This is where it all started unraveling. And we see further evidence of that hypocrisy and selectiveness in the brazen violation of refugee rights and the rampant Islamophobia that we see. And finally, we cannot forget the role of the northern-based human rights sector itself. And in this, I include many non-governmental actors, including Amnesty International. For too long, many of us had an over-reliance on American and European guardianship of human rights. When our power, money, and decision-making comes from the North, we send a message about the moral authority of the North, and we lose our organic connection with struggles in other parts of the world. This problem has long afflicted NGOs and the United Nations system, which is regarded by some as synonymous with human rights. Now, I do not want to be critical of the whole edifice. Some NGOs, international NGOs, and some parts of the UN are more in touch than others with the ground reality, but this, not, this does not happen automatically. It has to be underpinned by a real commitment to remain committed. So there is no shortage of new initiatives to recast or reframe human rights in a way that suits powerful countries and leaders and neuters human rights. China is at the forefront of this, with many allies and contributors, collaborators, in emphasizing national sovereignty and the need for human rights to be adapted to national conditions. In other words, undermining the premise of universality while half-heartedly playing it along. It's not all disengagement and bad news. China was the first permanent member of the UN Security Council to join calls for a ban on autonomous weapon systems, for example, and China's focus on economic transformation for the poorest sectors of society is an important corrective to the Western or Northern overemphasis on civil and political rights. But China's is an approach which is unapologetic about picking and choosing. 
with a view to neutralizing human rights as a set of tools for struggles against the abuse of its own power. The idea that economic development can be achieved only at the cost of suppressing people's voice and dissent is hard to accept. The new assertive Chinese foreign policy and the recent meeting convened by the Chinese government of many emerging economies to redefine human rights with Chinese characteristics is a space that needs to be closely watched. So now to my third, the third of my main points, which is that given the tendency of the powerful towards instrumental, instrumentalizing human rights for other ends, how can we reclaim the foundational element of struggle? How can we be true to the heart of human rights and set ourselves up for success? How can we truly decolonize human rights? And this is a very timely question in a season of growing intellectual contestation on the relevance, efficiency, and future viability of the international human rights system. We have all noted the challenge posed by Eric Posner in The Twilight of Human Rights, where he expresses the concern that a concern that what he sees as purposefully unenforceable human rights treaties are presumably causing system failures in international human rights. We've seen Stephen Hopgood in The End Time of Human Rights bemoaning the onslaught against human rights by conservative national and nationalist and religious forces. And more recently, we saw Samuel Moyne in the New York Times challenging those who care about human rights not only to wag a finger in the face of abusers, but to take seriously the forces that lead so many people to vote in majoritarian strongmen in the first place, and so on. Now, all these are important contributions into the conversation about the present state of human rights and their future. I suggest, however, that they have two limitations. Firstly, we could be more systematic about whether and how the system is working or not working. Are all treaties failing? Are they all failing in the same way? Scholars, including Catherine Sickink and Ryan Goodman, have shown in a granular way how some treaties have been very effective. But the second point of critique is more relevant to my discussion today. The current crop of skeptical scholarship seems to be based on a certain assumption about what human rights are and when they emerged. But I would like to reiterate my preference to understand human rights as the affirmation of ongoing struggles against abuse, overreach, and the violence of power in all times and climes. And in that context, let's circle back to our topic and let me consider the specific question of how then we decolonize human rights. So working from my proposition that human rights, agree, uh, human rights exist for the struggles against the abuse of power in all its forms, I would like to suggest three important directions of travel uh, that are essential for us to move this agenda forward. Firstly, we have to set out a compelling vision for humanity which resonates with ordinary people which enables human rights to be a powerful vehicle for their struggles. We have a serious problem in, on our hands in many parts of the world, from Philippines to Turkey and from India to the United States, where human rights advocates who've always seen themselves as the voice of the poor and marginalized are now being painted as the elite and enemies of endogenous development. Even in the UK's Brexit debate, Human rights activists who support immigration and refugee rights, just as in the US or Hungary for that matter, are being portrayed as those who are removed from the masses whose identity or jobs are being taken away. In India, if you support diversity and respect for all religions today and are in favor of treating all human beings as equal, including Kashmiri Muslims, you would be called anti-national or you could be called anti-national. In this sense, I think it's very, very important for us to, uh, for human rights advocates, uh, in this sense, human rights advocates are themselves being portrayed as antagonists uh, and as colonizers. So they're being presented as fighting for the rights of minorities and bad guys. So Samuel Mo Moyne has argued that human rights are the vehicle for our utopian dreams, but we cannot take it for granted that people articulate their utopia in human rights terms. <clears throat> Part of the answer, to go back to basics of why human rights for all matter, uh, 
um, is the, some of the concrete actions that we have taken, I wanted to bring to your attention at Amnesty International. We're making a big push to ensure access to human rights education and building rights-respecting societies in many parts of the world. In the last year alone, we've had over a million people who have been part of this education process, including through online massive, massive online courses of MOOCs, as some of you may know, and a recently established online human rights academy in the Middle East. <clears throat> and new ethical questions are on the horizon to which we need to supply answers. There are many, many uh, new colonizers from the corporate world, many in Silicon Valley. <coughs> some of them are colonizing the internet, some want to occupy other planets and outer space. Exponential technologies are raising fresh questions about what it means to be human. If we arrive at a situation when a supreme breed of mankind is enhanced by machines to maintain extreme dominance, while other humans are preemptively removed from society, because they are judged likely to commit certain crimes, will we even pay lip service to an idea of human equality? As we see this challenge on the horizon, as we see a boom in artificial intelligence today, as we see growing automation, stripping away jobs and raising questions about the fitness of our social security models, as we see ever more clearly the effect of opaque algorithms on our tribalism and collective decision making, the need for an ethical framework is abundantly clear. Human rights champions need to rise to this challenge and articulate answers. Secondly, it's very important to go beyond talking about indivisibility of rights to fundamentally challenging the distinction between civil and political rights on the one hand and economic and social rights on the other. People do not experience their lives in these terms. What is political is economic, what is civil is social. It is important to say that this, this distinction has never really been made in the South. It's a luxury afforded by those who enjoy economic prosperity. Neither was it baked into the early conceptions of human rights. In fact, Roosevelt's Four Freedom speech is clear on that point. Rather, the interrelationship is clear. People need a voice in the decision making about the economic and social future. And as I said at my earlier talk at the London School of Economics in 2012, those who have no voice are poor, and those who are poor have no voice. And often this predicament happens when people are at the mercy of powerful companies and governments working in tandem. And there are few better examples in the world today than the child laborers working in the artisanal cobalt mines of the Democratic Republic of Congo, which account for around 10% of the world's cobalt supply. Almost certainly some of it is in the pockets of those of us present in the room today in our phones. Uh, although the tide is slowly beginning to turn, thanks to concerted company uh, campaigning from Amnesty and other actors, companies are still doing too little to root out child labor from their supply chains. While the government, of course, is more interested in keeping problems hidden away than in confronting them. And in this context, I, I am using this example to remind us that it's totally artificial to separate out the civil and political elements of the struggle from the economic and social elements. I'd also like to point to the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities dating from 2006. The normative emphasis of that convention blend together both sets of rights, from political participation rights to health and habitation, framed from the bottom up, that is, in the service of specific groups of people, human rights transcend the artificial frames of civil, political, and economic, social rights, which reflect a Cold War dichotomy. And this kind of awareness and analysis is critical for the future success of human rights. Thirdly, those who believe in human rights need to connect and reconnect with the struggles at the local level. All that I've said so far formed the basis for Amnesty's big shifts over the, la uh, over the last <coughs> five or six years, distributing our secretariat globally so that we are operating much closer to the ground because unless our posture is standing shoulder to shoulder with people in their struggles,
Unless our movement of people reflects the composition of societies we hope to influence, and unless we are calibrated for the dynamics of local struggles, we cannot truly hope to bring lasting change. The global appetite for what Amnesty offers uh, is also really interesting, and we have tested this in the, in the last year by not just establishing our offices across the world, but also recruiting members and activists in many new parts of the world where we've not had a very strong presence. This slide gives you some sense of some of the big countries where we've had, in the last one year alone, we've recruited more than a million online members for the first time in countries such as Egypt, Nigeria, Pakistan, but also with strong national presence in Nigeria, Indonesia, Mexico, Turkey, and Argentina. Now, and I'm mentioning this because international solidarity was a powerful driver for northern publics and organizations to support struggles in the global south. <clears throat> but this sometimes became a substitute for agency. Solidarity became a substitute for agency. At the heart of the Human Rights Project is the importance of power and agency remaining in the hands of those who are suffering oppression and injustice. This idea was perfectly captured by the disability movement which said nothing about us without us. Seen through this lens, human rights are about the struggles of affected people and communities and the solidarity that these struggles seek to garner. Strengthening and celebrating agency does not in any way take away from the importance and power of international solidarity. Now, one of the ways we can reconnect with local struggles is through the <coughs> partnerships we build. There is, for example, plenty of unexplored potential for human rights groups and faith communities to make common cause. I, I do not want to underestimate some of the fault lines in, in working with faith groups, but both speak about values, both draw on the engagement of people who want to realize those values in the world. For example, in promoting welcoming attitudes towards refugees or minorities, human rights groups already tap into the moral resources that are often provided by, the, by religious faith groups. This could be developed into deeper partnerships, for example, by placing refugee families in the care of welcoming communities, which can set a positive example to others. So let me conclude. And as I conclude, let me say that the threats of colonization and instrumentalization to the human rights project are not going to go away. And while in the past, we saw the abuse of power through colonial domination, now instead we see how the human instinct to dominate is taking different forms. But the same dynamics hold true. Those who wield power carry out abuses for which the rest pay. So the same old question remains for the contemporary human rights project. How do we place power in the hands of those left behind to hold to account those who abuse their power? Our quest to find the answers does not begin in the rarefied air of the United Nations buildings. It does not lie in the university lecture halls of the London School of Economics or any other university or in courtrooms. It does not definitely lie in the offices of Amnesty International or any other international NGO. And I, I should say all of these are important places of human rights and I do not be mistaken, I'm not trying to undermine the importance of these places, but our quest to decolonize human rights begins in the struggles, the gatherings of people to challenge oppression. Today, the beating heart of human rights is in the growing number of people's movements across the world, many of them powered by young people who are outraged by the abuse of power. We see that from the USA to Hong Kong to Venezuela to Iran, we see people standing up at a huge cost to themselves. And across the African continent, seismic shift or seismic shift in countries like Ethiopia, South Africa, and Zimbabwe, all of which have seen major political change following almost entirely peaceful protests. One particular source of inspiration over the past year has been the movement of women and girls growing in stature and strength over the past year. You are all aware of the Me Too movement and the women's marches, but the Latin American power which came through the Ni Una Menos campaign was something which people in this part of the world might be less familiar with. But all of this have lent massive new momentum to old struggles. Dismantling patriarchy is perhaps 
the oldest struggle of them all. And of course, it's not an isolated one. Women's rights movements for many years have shown us the importance of the intersectional nature of struggles, black women, Dalit women, women with disabilities, and women with diverse sexualities are all fighting multi-layered battles. But at the end, it comes back to their pursuit of dignity and equality in the face of historic oppression and injustice. And across the world, some of the most potent advocates of human rights are the women in the heart of the struggles. So let me close my talk with the story of one woman who I met recently called Melchura. Melchura is an indigenous women's rights activist in Peru. It was one of my greatest honors to sit alongside Melchura last November at a press conference in Lima. A press conference about Melchura's community and their fight for clean water in the face of industrial corporate development and greed. In the absence of clean water, many people, men, women, and children alike, were falling sick in her community and the children were unable to function in school. Disadvantage piled upon disadvantage. But Melchor and others in her community took up their case and fought it at every level in pursuit of justice. So for me, Melchora is something of a lodestar for all human rights activism. Her courageous battle against the most basic injustice in the face of a massive power differential, but with the dogged determination that the rightness of her demand will prevail. And that really is where human rights begins and ends. Thank you very much. I just wanted to mention, Susan, I, I, I try and show this film to audiences when I travel because uh, obviously we, we can talk about 22 million refugees and you know the global refugee crisis, but um, if you want to, in, in, in the context we're in where societies are so polarized, it's one thing about governments who don't want to support do the right thing on the refugee convention, but we also have societies which are polarized. So we, it's really very different when you talk about one refugee and one family, and you know you look at the humanity and the individual impact of what's happening, than talking about the construct of human rights in a, in a kind of very generic, open way. And so I just thought it's it's interesting to get this to the audience. Yes. Fantastic. Yes. Um, and, and also the, the the book ending of your talk. Uh, in relation to two women. So we have J.K. Rowling inviting us to think in terms of solidarity, but then we have Melchora incarnating agency, uh, which was clearly the direction in which you were inviting us to, to travel. So uh, we have about half an hour to discuss some of the themes that have come out of Salil's talk. It's incredibly rich, uh, so we're gonna have a lot to talk about. The whole question of colonialism and its long shadow, the way in which it's visible in resistance to human rights scrutiny, but also in initiatives uh, of human rights. The idea of decolonization as at once a driver of the enunciation and institutionalization of human rights and an ongoing project for the human rights movement. Who would like to begin us in an exploration of of some of these themes and raise comments or questions. Perhaps when you do uh, intervene, if you could identify yourself. Uh, and there's a, a roving microphone. Uh, who would like to? It's always off? difficult to ask questions after this video because everybody's still recovering <laughs> from. Stunned. Yeah. Yes. Anyone like to speak? Perhaps while you're thinking. Oh, yes. Okay. The back. Hi, Will Venters. I'm local to the LSA. I work here. Um, this isn't really my area, but I just I thought it was very interesting that you ended with a very personalised video, and I was just struck um, by the uh, the colonialisation of technology, and in particular the dehumanising of. Um, Technology, which is often dominated by uh, a, a northern uh, American perspective, for instance, social media, um, and how that technology perhaps is recolonizing and reducing those human relationships to something which is industrial and algorithmic. 
and I just wondered if you could comment on that. Yes. Thank you. Um, I have uh, actually spent a fair bit of time with the sort of Silicon Valley tech world in the last few years. And it's very interesting to, I mean, I'm sure all of you have had your own exposure to this. They're a kind of a, a kind of a species of their own. They're, they're kind of really interesting because on the one hand, they believe that they can conquer anything because they have all the power. They're truly global in their reach. They don't think small. They think super big, super global. Um, but it's at the same time grounded in their, you know, chai latte in, in whatever corner of Silicon Valley they're sitting. So it's kind of this duality is quite shocking. But I think the, the power of technology, is, the way I talk about it is that you, you have, it's, the reality is that it's a massive set of opportunities and a massive set of threats, both coexisting. And there's no question that it's a new axis or the, probably the, most, the latest and the most dangerous axis of inequality. There's no question about that. Um, just to give you one example, the, one of the things which people are not very aware of often is if you take, uh, of course, we heard of the Cambridge Analytica story and what it's doing in the US and, and the UK, et cetera. But lesser known is the role of Facebook in uh, Myanmar. So some of you may be aware that uh, Mark Zuckerberg launched this initiative called Free Basics, where he took free internet to several countries. India refused it because it was against the principle of net neutrality. But Myanmar moved, uh, Facebook usage in Myanmar moved from I think one or two million to 10 million recently, and the entire, or anyway, very significant part of the anti-Rohingya campaign in uh, Myanmar is run on Facebook. And, and that's when you kind of imagine, you know, of course the government was rather pleased that you know, this was happening, so they're silent, Facebook's been silent, and I think it's only now that they're waking up to the reality that they have to intervene. We recently did a piece of work on Twitter, and Jack Dorsey is probably amongst the top people who hate Amnesty right now. Uh, we did the work both in the UK and particularly looking, uh, we did some work on Argentina and a few countries on the level of online abuse against women uh, on Twitter. So I mean, the list is long. I mean, the, the kind of predictive policing, for example, that the UK and US are using, which simply builds on pre-existing biases against black men, mostly young men. And so all of the negative stuff is there. On the other hand, we are using technology ourselves for crowdsourcing, for, for all sorts of amazing things. We now have you know, tens of thousands of what we call decoders who are in all sorts of places in the world to decode our satellite imagery image uh, because it will take staff of Amnesty maybe two, three years to do this and people across the world get together and decode our satellite imagery in a matter of weeks. Now, I don't think it'd be possible to have the kind of protests we've had in the world without the mobilization potential of uh, all the social media. So I think uh, my view is that you know we should kind of intervene, and that's why Amnesty has now set up a, uh, an office in Silicon Valley. We are putting, we have about 15 people now working on technology and human rights to make sure that there is an ex-ante ethical framework in place. So we've joined the Artificial Intelligence Partnership. We just had the Toronto Declaration this week at the RightsCon uh, conference where all the top people are there. I'm speaking at the Web Summit with all these, you know, 20 year old programmers who, who I must be the oldest person by far in the room. Um, but I, the interesting thing is that they also, the, you know, when it comes to human rights, broadly speaking, most of them are very open and positive. They just don't know. I don't think they have even thought through what the human rights impact of a lot of what they're doing is. So there's a certain openness. And, I mean, I'm not talking about the three or four big corporations who are controlling everything, but if you look at it at the kind of rank and file level, there's a lot of opportunities as well. I don't know if I quite answered your question, but. Reactions, yes. Hello, uh, Sudanshu Swaroop. I'm a practicing barrister. Uh, my, my question is this. Uh, in all of this, to what extent do you regard lawyers as part of the problem <laughs> rather, than, rather than otherwise? And, and to the extent they are part of the problem, uh, how can we be more part of the solution? It's a very difficult question coming from a QC. <laughs> so, no, no, I, I don't, I mean, I, 
I, I'm, you know, I'm one of the first people to say that because the situation is so unfavorably placed against the poor and the marginalized and the voiceless, more than anybody else, they need the rules of the game, they need law, they need some equalizing force. And where the law can be a force for good, absolutely we should use it. And Amnesty is using it all the time. So it's certainly, my only worry is that, and certainly in the Amnesty context, I've been railing against this within Amnesty as well, not to make human rights a discussion purely about international law. So it's that, you know, getting the balance right between the different as aspects of human rights is what I'm trying to push for here. I wouldn't ever, Sudan, should say that lawyers like you are not needed. <laughs> I know the work you're doing on international corporate law. So. At the back. Hi, Salud. Thanks for your talk. Um, I work for a democracy support organization. I've done uh, some work with um, national human rights commissions. I'm just wondering what your view is on, you said the, the focus shouldn't be too much on I suppose the international um, human rights framework, the UN framework, but your your thoughts on the role of national human rights commissions in, um, and also related commissions like women's commissions, uh, women commissions on children, in one, um, the protection of human rights uh, on the national level or the subnational level, and then two, also uh, preventing interference from other actors when we talk about, I suppose, the colonization of, of human rights. So, as, as I mean, if you're working on it, you know better than me that uh, we don't have that many national human rights commissions and institutions which are truly independent. I know we have the whole Paris principles, and or, I mean, I think it's the right thing to have, and it's what we should be moving towards. I mean, we are certainly pushing hard for uh, strengthening the work at the regional and national level, and you know, so the international level really becomes kind of a last resort process. You don't start with the international, you build local, national, regional, so you move bottom up. So I think they're very important uh, conceptually and uh, in principle. In practice, most, <coughs> particularly in countries where we need strong national human rights commissions, is where the government will make sure that there isn't a strong National Human Rights Commission. So, which is why I'm saying that yeah, the formal institutional structures are important, but in places where human rights are being tested, you know, I wouldn't really be going in Turkey to meet the National Human Rights Commission, for example, because we know that you know they'd be totally neutralized. I had this amazing experience when uh, we had two of our people locked up in Ethiopia as amnesty prisoners of conscience, um, and. I, I went there, we met with Meles Zenawi, the then Prime Minister, and I, I was asking for permission to meet our prisoners uh, in, in Kalete Prison in, in Addis. And he said to me, you should travel with the, the, our head of the National Human Rights Commission in Ethiopia. I didn't even know that existed, because Ethiopia has not been very human rights friendly and we're hoping for big change right now. So in the car, he told me, you know, yeah, I'm an expert on, on human rights law. He had never been to Kalete prison in his life. He said, it's such a great opportunity that we are both going there. I've never been there myself, which is a horrible prison in Addis. The fact that he's not gone there told you a story already. And then he told, so I asked him, so where did you study human rights in Ethiopia? Because I didn't even know they had courses. He said, no, no, I studied in Moscow. So I said, okay, so you now are Russian. He's, he's learned international human rights in Moscow. And now he's ahead of the, so I don't want to kind of uh, trivialize your question, but the fact is it's a big challenge. It's important, but we have a long way to go. Yeah, hello, uh, my name is Mike Scott. I'm a trade unionist. Um, you touched on the Myanmar situation. Um, I mean, there's a very insightful documentary was on uh, BBC the last couple of evenings by Simon Reeve. Um, you know, what's Amnesty's approach going to be on that, particularly in light of the current situation with the Rohingya people? I, I haven't seen the actual documentary, but I've been, I'm quite involved in the Rohingya question. You know, part of it is that you're probably aware that Aung San Suu Kyi was an Amnesty prisoner of conscience. We fought her case for decades. So obviously, her approach and her inaction has been hugely disappointing for us. Um, I actually met with her one-on-one -on -one in um, Nepidor, and then I just last month went to Bangladesh, met with Sheikh Hasina, who's the Bangladesh Prime Minister. Um, there's complete distrust from both sides. The Rakhine Commission, which Kofi Annan you know, was heading, I think has come up with the right recommendations, but the implementation part is really not happening. So, um, and any effort to take it to the ICC, of course, means that China will veto. Uh, 
um, any resolution of the ICC. Um, so I can't say that you know there's some bright, immediate uh, kind of uh, ray of hope there. I think it's a long struggle. Our appeal to Sheikh Hasina was that under no circumstances should Bangladesh return Rohingyas to Myanmar unless the preconditions of safe, dignified, you know, all the basic things are in place. And I hope that she will stick to that. She accepted that that's important for them to do. But I don't see any short-term solutions. Um, I think we're trying to see if we can at least get them to speak to each other a bit informally in a sort of track two way. But it's still a long, long way. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm Bronwyn Manby. I'm a um, visiting teaching and research fellow here at the LSE, and I've also been doing some work for Amnesty. In connection of which, I have a question for you. How, where would you place the balance for Amnesty between the stress on individual human rights and the value of community, which is also expressed in Universal Declaration, with particular reference to the um, so-called migration crisis and the legitimate concerns that they exist that that have, have that have been a foundation for some illegitimate populist demands versus equal rights for all including rights to freedom of movement i mean i think the you know the migration debate has been so polarizing and so full of uh, falsehoods so i think what we are trying to do certainly is to use the individual and that was why i partly i showed the video to use the individual sort of reality to communicate this to the public. But uh, I mean, the issue is collective in that sense. It's not only about individuals, because there is a kind of phobia which cuts across uh, and kind of stereotypes and prejudices which are collective. They're not individual. Uh, now, uh, legally, of course, from our, you know, our overall position on the, on, the, on the refugee crisis has been that the only, so, I mean, obviously, in the first instance, we should prevent the crisis from happening, which is kind of the Antonio Guterres line, which I would very much subscribe to, that we should try and deal with it in Syria, et cetera. But that's easier said than done. And then there's the whole issue of what happens in the transition, and then, of course, in the destination countries. And in a global sense, we, our collective solution, which is not individual, but very much collective, is that there has to be a global responsibility sharing, which is the only way in which you know, serious resettlement can happen and we can find a solution to what is now the biggest crisis since the Second World War. But at the same time, we also take up individual cases on you know, migrants' rights, refugee rights. We do that as well. I don't see the two as either, I might have not fully understood your question, but certainly I think we would push for both. But I think the challenge is, um, is so big right now that you know we have to take it piece by piece. Now, in a practical sense, following the summit, which was, as far as we were concerned, a very failed summit two years ago, uh, when that was the last few months of o the Obama administration, the UN summit and the Obama summit, we moved from pushing governments for large-scale global resettlement to moving towards private community sponsorship, and that's the work we are focused on right now. Canada has got a good model, working model. It's still very small scale, but we're hoping to get more governments engaged in that. Yes. Hi. Salil, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us this evening. Earlier this year, in the Indian newspaper, The Hindu, um, you were quoted as saying you decolonized Amnesty International. What did you mean? When did Amnesty International become colonized, and what is it you did to decolonize it? I, I didn't see that particular quote. I mean, I, I wouldn't make that claim that I decolonized it. Um, as I said in my presentation, Peter was ex colleague of ours from Amnesty. For those of who you don't know, Peter, I think the, I mean, I think the issue really for me has been that. Uh, we want to get a much better balance between international solidarity and bottom-up agency. I don't believe that amnesty was either or at any point in time, but I think the balance was much more on having a much stronger presence in the North. We always had an aspiration to have a strong presence in the South, but I think that's been a struggle for amnesty over the decades, and I think not suggesting that we are there today, we still have a long way to go, but I think we're certainly in a stronger position now to have a stronger voice in the South, a stronger base in the South, to work with human rights defenders on the ground, to stand with them side by side. 
to take the risks which they are taking as well, because you know that's a big challenge otherwise for our legitimacy. So I think that's the context and that's the concept. Not I, I don't want to kind of overclaim <laughs> that we've decolonized yet. Maybe I'll pose a question at the moment. So you, you spoke quite a lot about abuse of power, and in that connection you mentioned at one point the human instinct to dominate. Uh, I wonder to what extent we're talking about something that's, that's referable to human nature, or, or to what extent we're, we're talking about something that, uh, that has a political economy to it. So when I think, for example, of that case of uh, child labor in the DRC, you mentioned cobalt um, and coltan. Uh, is, is, that, is that abuse of power or is that corporate entities doing what corporate entities do, seeking to make money and exploit people? I'm, I'm not sure, Susan, as to how you're differentiating between the two, because, I mean, I'm not trying to make a psychoanalytical point about the, you know, kind of Desmond Morris, uh, kind of human nature kind of uh, statement. I think the I think the reason why companies or governments get away with the, uh, I mean, continue to abuse power is because they get away with it. So I think in that sense, I'd be closer to your political economy analysis. Um, and we need to have checks and balances, some of which will come from the legal system. But I think at the end of the day, you know, the politics of it becomes much more critical than the legal system, that if you don't have people on the ground who are going to hold their leaders to account, you know, every law is uh, abused and misused. And, and uh, we were just talking about this earlier today. I was walking down Fleet Street, and it was really interesting to see that all the big law firms have their offices right next to all the big banks and corporate institutions. That could not be a complete uh, coincidence, I think, that, you know, that these two things have to be close to each other and because they're both safeguarding each other's interests. But I think the, the bottom line is that in the DRC case, uh, I mean, the, the, I'm sure you're aware that cobalt is really the new gold. You know, the prices have just skyrocketed unimaginably. And so the kind of money that the corporations are making who are actually mining cobalt is mind-blowing. And these are some of the poorest people in the world. So, you know, this classic resource curse question is playing out in such a, you know, horrific way in DRC. And the government and the companies are standing by and watching it. So whatever be our analysis, you want to call it political economy or human nature, I think the reality is in front of us. Hi, my name is Christina. I work in development. Um, I wanted to go back to your third point on how we could decolonize human rights. And you're making the point of that it needs to be or that it should be a bottom-up approach, especially in countries in the south, um, and maybe not so much in Geneva or in this LSE lecture hall. And so I was wondering what you think what we could do better in Geneva, in New York, in this LSE lecture hall, or what countries of the north could do better in order to work together with the with the human rights defenders in countries of the south. Thanks. So two things, you know, my I have two responses to that. And I, I said this in SOAS last week when I was speaking there, that you know, historically we've said that the West is that human rights is a Western agenda and they are pushing their agenda on the on the South, etc. Fortunately that problem is over now because they have pretty much abandoned all, you know, respect for human rights. So whether it's on uh, the war on terror, whether it's on the treatment of refugees and migrants, or you know, surveillance, emergency laws in France, you know, we could have a long list. So that's less of a problem. But interestingly, uh, so that gives a huge job for people from this part of the world. So because when we say international, it's mostly a synonym for northern, really. So because when we say international media, we mean northern media. We say international NGO, we mean northern NGO. So I think the so-called international people, who are basically the northern people, they now have a big job on their hands, which is not to worry only about what's happening somewhere else. For the first time in a long time, they better start worrying about their own people. Because you know all this uh, divide and rule, the Erdogan and the Dutertes and the Modis of the world, it's not particularly new for us. You know, We've had Rajapaksa, we've had many of these divide and rule people. Why the West or the North has woken up is because of the first time you have Trump and you have Brexit. So suddenly it's that problem has hit their own doorstep. So if you ask me what is the task for these institutions in the North, I think first 
hold your own governments to account, your own leaders to account. I think that's a big new job. <laughs> we have to start all over again. So if we had an Arab Spring, we probably need a you know a British Spring now. Um, and and the and the second part, you know, is the whole issue of the. As I said in my presentation, I don't think I do not want in any way to minimize or to you know. Un, I don't know what the right English word is, disvalidate, unvalidate, uh, invalidate the importance of the support which grassroots organizations and groups, those who are struggling at the, at, the, at the ground level, they need all the help, they need all the support. I don't want to suggest in any way it's not important. The question is how do you provide that support? I mean, this is a big question for Amnesty all the time. You know, we're kind of a, uh, you know, a, whatever pound gorilla going into a place like Nigeria. How do you work with local organizations? How do you make sure that you're strengthening what they're doing and not taking away from them? I think it's very important for Amnesty to be there because Amnesty brings a certain international reputation and power, but it's not to substitute or take away from local power. You know, so how do you? I think it's a very nuanced issue as to how do you work in partnership in a respectful way. Okay. One. Uh, a, a good friend of mine, I don't even heard of him, was a man called Richard Hauser who ran the Institute for Rights and Responsibilities, but um, he also talked about the posture of psychic phenomena, uh, paranormal phenomena in terms of in getting the, um, the uh, well, reducing the amount of human rights abuse in the world. Now, being in India, which is an important country, one of the richest heritages of this kind, I wonder whether you could say anything in that. Did I talk about the paranormal? <laughs> I may have, without quite realizing it. I do that sometimes, I go into a trance. But I think, uh, you know, if we, India is a story in itself, and I'm very happy to go into it. I think the, the challenge with India, I mean, leaving the sort of paranormal question aside, I think the challenge with India is that we have, and this is an increasing challenge in many developing countries, that we have, if you look at the constitution, you look at the laws, I mean, they're as good as you can get. Our laws are just about, you know, they're top class, they're cutting edge, we've borrowed the best from every country. And then there's the reality of the implementation, which simply doesn't exist. So how do you then move from the norms and the laws to enforcement and realization of rights to those who are excluded? You're back to the question of how do you create political power and, you know, grassroots organizing and mobilization and that's the only way you can hold governments and corporations to account, I think. You have a pretty cutting edge Supreme Court. Yeah, I mean, we, we are relying on them every day these days, so. Okay, uh, all right, one more question and then we're gonna to have to close the, the young lady in the purple top. Thank you very much, this is very engaging. Um, I'm a master's student here. I used to work at the IMF and I was wondering, you talked about the economic, um, cultural and social rights um, and how that's sort of not distinct from um, the political and civil rights and that that's important to recognize both. And I kind of wonder, um, both the IMF and the World Bank look at their mandate uh, as being a little bit different than human rights. So of course they would value it and think it's really important. They're more focused on, for different aspects obviously, as you know, of development or financial stability. What do you see as the role of human rights um, as a movement in connection and conversation with some of these big international financial institutions and this kind of focus on GDP growth or economic growth as maybe a, a, another side of the same coin or problematic? What do you see as that discussion going forward? So the, um, the euphemism which the World Bank uses for human rights is called governance. So it's very interesting. So the development folks, when they talk about human rights, they call it governance. When businesses talk about human rights, they call it rule of law. And when we call, when we do it, we call it human rights. And so I don't really mind what people call it. Uh, and you know, I don't think that the bank or the IMF, I mean the bank said they don't do anything on corruption for a long time, the World Bank. Now they're in the thick of it. Um, and the whole, the other way in which a soft sort of entry is happening into the question of human rights in the context of the big international financial institutions is through the lens of what they call inequity, which is not inequality, but inequity. So they're very particular to say that inequity is uh, inequality of opportunities, not inequalities of voice or income. So, I mean, so there's kind of a backdoor entry happening because I think more and more the bank and uh, IMF are realizing that unless you have uh, 
some basic institutions and you know the, the functioning uh, human rights context uh, you're putting your money into a black hole so uh, and i mean of course the bank is then governed by its own board if they say human rights the chinese will not be happy so they're doing this juggling act but i mean i think you know i worked on the development side for for the first 20 years and i had no doubt in my mind that we are not going to get social and economic development which is the so called economic social rights side of things without having civil and political rights i'm, I'm totally convinced by that that you know if you don't have basic governance uh, accountability voice and place you're not going to have sustained economic development irrespective of what uh, singapore or rwanda might say well, our time is at an end. This has been a wonderful talk, a wonderful presentation, sobering, illuminating, and provoking all at the same time. Please join me in thanking Salil Chetty. Thank you.